Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to um, uh, present at the conference today. I'll, I'll talk uh, about cleft lip and palate uh, repair. Uh, clefts are very common. Um, a child is born somewhere in the world uh, about every two and a half minutes uh, with a cleft. In the United States last year, about 7,000 children uh, were born with clefts, about 2,500 with clefts of the palate, and about 4,500 uh, children were born with uh, clefts of both the lip and the palate. Uh, the incidence of clefts is, is affected by race uh, and sex, um, as you can see uh, here below. Clefts come in a variety of types. On the left are incomplete clefts, uh, and on the right are complete clefts. And of course, the incomplete clefts can be divided into one-sided or two-sided. And the same is true for those uh, patients with complete clefts, again, one-sided or two-sided clefts. Clefts can also pass through the gums and affect the palate and there are three different varieties of clefts of the palate. Uh, the image on the far left shows an uncommon clefting type. It's almost an invisible cleft called a submucous cleft. And then in the middle we see the incomplete and the complete clefts. Well, these uh, two types of clefts um, seem to have um, a significance to parents. Uh, from a surgical standpoint, both the incomplete and the complete cleft uh, need, to, need to be treated surgically. It is not as if one cleft is smaller uh, and might not need treatment. Both of these clefts uh, require surgical treatment. Uh, years ago, working with the Centers uh, for Disease Control, we came up with uh, seven key concerns um, in, uh, in cleft care. Um, and at the time, social media dis didn't exist. So I'd, I'd add to that list uh, an eighth key concern, which is social media referral. I think this is really important. And most of the patients that I see in the office have already gotten connected uh, um, on social media with other parents uh, who have children with clefts. There are, of course, lots of different um, social media avenues uh, for getting connected. Uh, one of the ones that I like most is Clef Mom Support, uh, and that's on Facebook, and there's about 10,000 participants uh, on that um, social media platform. And again, like always, for, for anyone using the internet, you should be judicious in, in your use of the information coming from uh, any social media um, um, platform, but I think they're great opportunities to, to meet uh, other parents and to, uh, to learn a lot on your own. Well, of these seven uh, key concerns here listed in black, of course, there isn't time to go over uh, all of these, so I'll really just focus uh, on the last one, which is surgical repair. Now, surgical repair spans the spectrum from, from patients who are three months old uh, to adults. And, uh, and of course, in today's talk, there simply isn't time to cover all of the different options for surgical repair. So I'll really just stick with the, the primary surgical repair, which is treatment of the, of the nose, lip, and gums. And then very briefly, we'll talk about treatment of the palate uh, at the very end, just so we can stay on time today. So I should say, um, our team goal in, in the primary um, treatment of a patient with a cleft lip uh, is threefold. Uh, for every patient with a cleft, no matter the, the degree of severity, whether it is one-sided or two-sided, incomplete or complete, we always look at the child uh, on the outside to assess the uh, shape of the nose, uh, the lip, and then the dental alveolus or gums. Uh, this is where the teeth will ultimately come in. And just in about every clefting situation, all three of these um, structures are affected to some degree or another. And while they don't always, uh, all three don't always require treatment, uh, we want to look at them as a unit. Uh, because what we want to do is, is we want to take a patient pictured here on the left um, and get a patient uh, like we see here on the right uh, with nice nasal labial form. Um, and how do we do that? Well, uh, one of the great ways to get started getting a nice outcome is, is to use nasoalveolar molding. And Dr. Breck talked about this earlier today uh, in his lecture. But I just wanted to highlight it, it, its importance here in the surgical repair. NAM is not necessary in every patient. But in this example here, if you look from the inferior view, you can actually see the, the tremendous angulation in the shape of the nose. And that angulation is due to the fact the gums here on the left side are actually uh, displaced posteriorly, and, and so there's no support to the side of the nose, and the whole nose uh, is affected. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more in just a second about the two halves uh, of the gums and how we want to align those. But here in the middle image is the nasal molding uh, device in place. 
um, uh, reshaping the nose, but also aligning the gums. And then here you see on the far right, uh, now you see the alar bases of the nose here are in the same plane. The columella, the central portion of the nose, is much straighter. And again, you can see the two halves of the lip are now again in the same plane, whereas before NAM, uh, they, were, they were in very different planes. So now, now if we take a patient like this to the operating room, uh, I think there's much more that we can accomplish in a single operation uh, to get a better uh, lasting result. So there's lots of literature out there uh, on nasal alveolar molding, hundreds of articles uh, that talk about uh, the benefits and also the controversies of using NAM, but it's, it's really been well documented uh, in the literature uh, as a very powerful uh, uh, pre-surgical tool. NAM is typically used um, uh, in patients with a one-sided cleft uh, between uh, the first week of life and about three months, and in a patient with a two-sided cleft or bilateral cleft, typically, again, it starts just after uh, delivery and extends up to about five, five and a half months of age. So of, of the nose, lip, and gums, let's start on the inside, and we'll look at the, uh, at the gums first or the, or the dento-alveolus. Um, here, here's a typical patient who has a, a one-sided cleft of the lip, we see that it affects the nose. You can see the cleft passing right through the gums here, and then the cleft uh, extends into the roof of the mouth. If I outline the two halves of the maxillary arch, you can see the, the two ends of these arch, uh, two ends of each half of the arch are not aligned. So as a surgeon, you would need to sew that uh, area that I've highlighted in white to that area. Uh, which is highlighted in white. And of course, in this configuration, you can't do it. Now, most patients with a complete cleft do not, ha do not naturally have uh, good uh, dental alveolar alignment, and this is where uh, pre-surgical techniques such as NAM come into place to, to straighten these gums out to allow for a repair. Well, let me show you what happens um, if you don't have NAM available. So, if you, if you can't repair the gums uh, when, uh, at the first surgery, Later on in life, somewhere around six, seven years of age, we wind up getting an x-ray, and you can see the bone here missing in the, in the area where the cleft passed through the gums. So of course, that area needs to be filled in. And in a second procedure, typically performed somewhere between seven and 10 years of age, we use a little trephine uh, to harvest bone from the hip. That bone is then placed into the dental alveolar cleft so that we can fill that area up and, and resolve the problem. So, uh, if, you, if you can't repair the gums primarily, you can still solve the problem later on by taking the patient through pre-surgical orthodontics uh, and then ultimately uh, identifying the area that is missing bone and finally putting bone in place. So the problem can be resolved, but it requires a second operation. What we like to do using nasovitor molding, uh, of course, is to align the gums so at the time of lip repair, we can also treat the gums. Now on this slide here, what you're looking at, uh, you're looking at stone models or casts of the dental alveoli uh, of a patient with a cleft. So we're looking at the gums uh, from one week of age up until three months of age. And I'll, I'll highlight the two halves of the gum here. So at one week of age, you can see the, the gums are, are widely separated. While this ruler really isn't to scale, you can see the, the width of the gap here. This gap is so wide uh, that the gums could not be repaired. By 1.5 uh, years, uh, 1.5 months of age, using nasoalveolar molding, you can now see the width of the gap become smaller. So now it's approaching a, a width that we could actually repair in the operating room. And by the time the child is, is ready for surgery at three months of age, you can now see the gap in the gums has become quite small. And you can also see the alignment. So the two ends of the gums are nicely aligned so that they can be repaired, uh, whereas before we were starting with quite a wide gap, or in some cases, uh, the two halves of the uh, upper dental arch are not in the same plane. <clears throat> so on the far right here, we have, we have a nice uh, dental alveolar alignment that was created by using the NAM device, which would then allow us to go on uh, and repair those gums. So this is what it looks like um, in a patient. Here you see on the, on the left side, uh, the right half of the uh, upper arch and the left half of the upper arch and of course the wide gap between the two. You can see the nose is affected because the dental alveolus here on the left is, is back. Um, so what NAM does of course is not only treat the nose but it's, it's bringing the gum segments together. So here after nasal alveolar molding now we've got nice alignment of the gums so when this patient uh, comes into the operating room 
we can actually sew the two halves uh, of the gums together so that the patient can ultimately have a nice healthy smile and that we can form bone or give the patient the opportunity to form bone uh, in the area of the gum repair. Now there's lots of research on this, but of course there isn't really time to go into it. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Um, in patients who have a one-sided cleft, about two-thirds of the patients will form enough bone from this uh, initial repair that they don't need a second operation um, uh, for bone grafting. And we found about 50% of patients with bilateral clefts will have enough bone simultaneously on both sides that they don't ultimately need uh, a second operation. So that's a huge benefit to patients to not have to go back to the operating room. Uh, also to uh, one of the issues that's often uh, talked about uh, with uh, any kind of gum repair is does it affect facial growth? And there isn't time to go into the studies today, but the answer to that is no. Uh, a good gum repair will not affect the growth of the midface so that a child uh, with a cleft uh, will have a normal midfacial growth uh, compared to a child uh, with a cleft who does not have a gum repair. So how does NAM affect the nose? Well, we'll take a look at that here in our next slide. Um, Michael Hogan described uh, uh, the, the appearance uh, of the nose ki kind of like a tripod. So if you imagine this, this image here uh, converted into the drawing, we've got the right alar base, the left alar base, the tip of the nose, and then we have the, um, we have the nasal septum here uh, right in the middle. Well, when you have a cleft, um, you're missing support. We talked about that denoa velis being, uh, dr having drifted laterally because of the cleft. Due to the lack of support, uh, you see the nasal septum begins to buckle, and of course that changes the appearance uh, of the nose. So what nasovelar molding does for us uh, in preparation for surgery, uh, of course, is that uh, nasovelar molding comes in, it lifts up the nasal dome, but also draws the gums across, so as the nasal alveolar molding device goes into place, you can now see, in essence, we're rebuilding uh, this missing platform here by bringing the gums across to support the nose, but the nasovelar molding device is also straightening out the septum uh, and uh, improving the nasal anatomy before we get to the operating room. So the picture on the right here um, is a patient who's completed the nasovelar molding right at about two and a half months of age and now is getting ready for surgery uh, at three months of age. And we looked at, again, there isn't time today, but we looked uh, in a study one time asking surgeons um, which type of patient do they think they could get a better outcome on, uh, a patient before NAM or after NAM, uh, in, in this large um, uh, study, it, most surgeons felt they could get a much better result uh, that would last for the patient when the anatomy was in a better starting position after the use of NAM. So uh, once we uh, take the patient to the operating room, uh, after the nasal leader molding is completed, one of the important things to do uh, as it relates to the nose is to overcorrect the nose. So if you look at this inferior view here, the alar base is brought way in, the nose uh, nasal tip uh, is, is really exaggerated, and this nostril is so much smaller. But this is intentional. Again, it's an anatomic repositioning that is overcorrected intentionally so that as time goes by, what you'll ultimately get uh, is nice uh, nasal symmetry. And we've looked at a number of studies, and again, I won't uh, spend the time to go into them today, but nasal alveolar molding in conjunction with primary nasal surgery improves long-term nasal symmetry. And similarly, nasal alveolar molding and primary nasal surgery do not impair uh, nasal growth. So these are really important points. But it shows that up until the teenage years, here in this case, 18 years of age, that NAM has a tremendous impact on improving the long-term uh, success of primary nasal surgery. So let's get to the lip. Uh, this is um, what most people uh, are, are focused on in cleft lip repair. Uh, how are we going to uh, treat the lip? Again, here's the same patient pre-NAM, post-NAM. You can see the lip segments are closer together. You can't see, but the gums uh, are also nicely aligned. And again, look at nasal form here. So the, the nasal form is improved by the nasal alveolar molding, giving us a better opportunity to get a nicer, longer lasting result in the patient on the right compared to the same patient if they didn't have NAM. So once NAM is complete, you could use any of a variety of, of surgical techniques uh, to repair the lip, and here are five of the most popular, but there's probably, oh, at least a couple dozen uh, surgical techniques that you could use. I, I like the surgical technique described by Dr. Cutting because it's an anatomic repair, and I like the way uh, the scar lies right on the filtral row. It tends to mirror the filtral row from the opposite side of the upper lip, and I, I just think it blends in best, but really any, any surgical technique could be combined. 
uh, with nasal alveolar molding. Now, when the patient walks into the operating room, um, this is kind of what's going through my head. There are a lot of anthropomorphic points uh, to assess when, when you're treating a child with a cleft uh, because you want to restore the anatomy uh, and get good symmetry, but also enable long-term growth. So if we trim down all of these points just to, to, to seven key points, I just wanted to show you how, um, w without showing you any gruesome surgical photos, uh, show you uh, what we're trying to achieve uh, when we look at these seven key points uh, in a patient at the time of surgery. In the lower part of the lip, we have the, 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 what's called the Christophiltry inferior. It's the lowest part of the filtral row. We have the center part of the lip called the labialis superius, and then we have the Christophiltry inferior on the cleft side. You can see these points should be in the same plane, and they should be parallel uh, to the floor, but of course with the cleft, uh, they're rotated upward. So one of the things we want to do is rotate those points uh, inferiorly so that we can create a cupid's bow that's nice and level. And then if you look at the asymmetry here uh, in the uh, columella and the ailer base, we want to bring the columella and ailer base closer together. And again, we want to overcorrect them so that at the end of the operating room, uh, when we, if we were to measure the distance on the non-cleft side, the distance would be shorter on the cleft side. And again, that's done intentionally so that we can have good uh, long-term uh, outcomes. So we'll look at just a couple of patients here um, to stay on time. I didn't want to show too many patients and run long. But here's an example of a patient who presents to us. This is a patient um, who's presenting at about one week of age who has a one-sided uh, cleft of the upper lip. The cleft passes through the gums and also through the palate. And you can see the nose is affected here. If we looked at the inferior view, you could see the lateral lip segment is, is, is very posteriorly displaced. Uh, relative uh, to the right half of the upper lip, and that's what's responsible uh, for this tilt in the tripod uh, of the nose. The patient goes through nasal alveolar molding, which is going to improve the shape of the nose, it improves the lip alignment, and it also improves the alignment of the gums. So this patient here at three months of age is ready to walk into the operating room or be carried into the operating room. Uh, and in that first operation, uh, we will be treating uh, the nose, uh, the upper lip, and the gums. So here's what a, a typically what a patient would look like about three weeks after surgery. You can see uh, we've got nice nasal shape. You can see the uh, light reflexes uh, from the flash bouncing off the nasal domes, the columellas uh, in the middle. If you looked at the curve of the ala here, this alar base position is a little bit medially displaced compared to the contralateral side, which is what we want to see. And then we see the swelling in the upper lip, the upper lip scar, and then we see a nice level uh, cupid's bow here in the middle. We get out to six months, and again, you see the light flashing off the nasal domes. The nasal symmetry uh, in the tip remains good. The ailer base symmetry is good. The curve of the ala are nice. And this is a 20 megapixel photo, so you can see the scar there, but in person, um, that scar becomes very hard to see. And again, the cupid's bow is, is level, the tubercle is restored, uh, and then the vermilion, the dry part of the lip, is nice and full. And then finally, in this example here, we're out to four years of age. And again, nasal shape remains good with the light flashing off the nasal domes. And we've got good nasal symmetry as well as good lip symmetry. So this is a typical example. Rather than running through a bunch of patient examples, I thought we'd spend just a little more time on, on one example here of a patient with a one-sided cleft lip. The same is true in a patient with a two-sided cleft of the lip. Uh, again, here is a baby about one week of age. This baby has a complete cleft on the right side and a complete cleft on the left side. The little bit of crusting here is actually uh, the equivalent of, of a chapped lip. This part of the gums should actually be inside of the mouth, uh, but because of the cleft, the two front teeth are over-projecting. You just can't tell that in the front view, and so this is becoming a dry, chapped uh, gums. So this patient here has a very short columella, very wide alar bases, and then again, it's hard to tell, but the two halves of the upper uh, gums uh, are well in front of the lateral arches, so of course the gums could not be repaired in this starting condition. So this patient goes through nasal alveolar molding. You can see the columella is beginning to be elongated. The premaxilla, this tissue here, is being pushed backwards. So that when we get to the end of nasal alveolar molding, and again in this case in the bilateral patient, nasal alveolar molding takes a little bit longer, four and a half, five months. In this case now you can see the, the premaxilla and prolabium are now in alignment with the lateral lip segments. 
The gums are lined up so that they can be repaired. The call umella has been elongated. You can begin to see the rudimentary form of a nasal tip here compared to where we started. And the width of the alar base is becoming shorter uh, as a product of nasolvator molding, drawing the two halves of the gums together. And the alar bases here are sitting right on the top of the gums. So as the gums come together, the alar bases come together. And then here's a patient at six months uh, after surgery. Again, we've got nice nasal, uh, nasal tip shape uh, and definition with the light uh, bouncing off the nasal domes. Uh, we've got a nice uh, elongated columella in, in pretty good shape to our ala, and the alar bases and the sweep of the ala are nice. And then we've got our uh, upper lip um, scars that have healed reasonably well, uh, representing the upper lip filtral rows. We've created a cupid's bow that didn't exist, uh, and we've also tried to create a tubercle uh, to create a natural appearance to the upper lip. Here's the same patient out to two years of age, and you can see the repair uh, holding up. And then here, if I can read my screen, I think it says to six years of age, uh, where again, we've got uh, reasonably good nasal uh, shape, a nice, uh, nice um, symmetry along the alar rims. The columella continues to grow as time goes by. And then like in all, all cases, the scars continue to improve over time, and these scars um, uh, usually, when, when the nasal labial form is good, the scars are usually hard to see, and we've got a nice uh, cupid's bow and a nice uh, tubercle. So this is representative, uh, I think, of, of what we uh, want to achieve and what you should expect in, in the case uh, of a patient uh, with a bilateral cleft lip. Well, since time is short, we'll jump uh, and just very, very briefly talk uh, about cleft palate repair. Um, the cleft of the palate uh, affects not only our ability uh, to, um, to feed, which uh, Shelley Cohen talked about in her lecture earlier today, but of course it, it primarily affects uh, or impacts our speech. So my goals um, in, in primary uh, palate repair are, are to separate the oral and nasal cavities. Of course, that makes it easier uh, to feed. Um, but I also want to restore the function of the, of the levator muscle, which is the muscle I'm using to speak to you now. And I also want to restore the function of the tensor muscle. That's the muscle that opens and closes the eustachian tubes. So when you go up or down in an airplane and your ears pop, that tensor muscle is, is contracting and opening the eustachian tubes. And this is really important, not only in airline travel, but it's important every day for kids to allow fluid to drain out of the middle ear. So when you have a cleft here uh, in the central part of the palate, both the levator, the speaking muscle, and the tensor, the muscle that goes to the ears, both are interrupted by the cleft. And what, uh, what I like to do during uh, palate repair, uh, of course, is to not only close the roof of the mouth, uh, but to also repair those two muscles. And then uh, you'll, you'll see different outcomes as you search around uh, on different web, websites or as you, as you meet uh, different uh, teams. Um, but the goal uh, for me, and I, I think the goal for our team, uh, is to have a very low palatal fistula rate and a very low uh, velopharyngeal insufficiency rate or VPI rate. Um, and the VPI, um, Shelley talked about in her speech um, uh, earlier uh, uh, today. But, but these are idealized goals. This is what we should be striving for is, is very low uh, incidence of, of these negative outcomes. But when the palate is repaired, these are the same patients, when the palate is repaired, you, you should have a nice healthy set of teeth um, and the palate repair itself uh, sh might be noticeable to an orthodontist, but it's certainly not gonna be noticeable uh, to, uh, to anyone else. So you should have a good, healthy, functional palate repair. So in sum, I'll, I'll wrap up here uh, to stay on time. Uh, the summary of early treatment stages. So we're just really focusing on, on primary care. Um, I think it's really important, if possible, uh, prenatally uh, to meet with a team. And of course, I think it's really important to get connected on social media. You'll learn an awful lot uh, from an awful lot of good parents uh, on social media. Um, in the neonatal period, if um, a, a pre-surgical technique uh, is, is indicated, uh, the one that I prefer is nasoalveolar molding. That typically, again, gets started at about one week of age. It's not necessary in every patient, uh, but when it is necessary, it has a tremendous uh, impact. The primary lip repair tends to occur somewhere between about three and six months of age, uh, closer to three months when you have a one-sided cleft lip, and a little closer uh, to five, five and a half, or six months if you have a bilateral cleft lip. Uh, well, we only touched on palate repair very briefly. Um, our practice here is to uh, repair the palate right around one year of age. You'll see a whole variety of, of uh, times proposed in, in the repair of the palate.
And I don't think I would focus on uh, a, um, uh, an age of palate repair as being important. What I would focus on instead is the outcome, and what you want is a very low VPI rate. So about one year of age uh, is, is what we strive for. And then in the early, um, early years post-surgery, the two things that, that most of our kids uh, after cleft treatment focus on uh, is uh, good healthy teeth um, and then uh, speech therapy uh, to have good speech habits. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to present uh, our work. Um, thank you.